I've been wondering for about three years now that we were headed towards civil war. And what I'm often asked by people is, if we actually had a civil war, what would it look like? Well, the answer is simple. Turn on your television. Because that's the civil war I'm talking about. Let me explain why. We are in a civil war. If you look at this country today and you compare it to the country in 1860 and 1861, we are more divided today over a wider variety of aspects of our daily lives than we were then. This country is deeply divided. And we are seeing violence in the streets. We're seeing strains between the states and the federal government. And we are in a civil war. When you hear the term civil war, you think of a big war, a modern war, an industrial war, a deadly war. You think of World War I, you think of World War II, but this isn't that kind of war. We haven't seen another World War II. We did see a World War III, but we didn't call it World War III because it was a world war that was attenuated. It was drug out. Instead of ending in four or six years, it ended up in just under a half century. That's how long it lasted. We call it the Cold War. The Cold War was the Third World War. We are presently in the early stages of an attenuated Cold Civil War, a second American Civil War. You could actually argue it's the third American Civil War. You can't what went on during the revolution, but that's another video. There's not really a historical example I could use to illustrate an attenuated cold civil war in a major industrial power. The closest I can come to is to look at the example of Lebanon and their civil war in the late 70s and early 80s. Now, that's probably an event that happened before most of you were aware of what was going on in the world, unless you're at least probably over about 65. But it happened when I was in college and I was studying the Middle East. So I did pay a lot of attention. Lebanon at that point was sort of a gem in the Mediterranean. It was uh, its capital, Beirut, was considered the Paris of the Middle East. It was the uh, a banking center of the Middle East. Lebanon was used as an example of what could happen in a sort of a secular Palestinian state where Jews and Arabs, Jews and Muslims will live side by side. I remember being in school and having professors telling me, well, we could do this. Just look at Lebanon. Of course, nobody in their right mind would use Lebanon as an example for any of that today because of the civil war that broke out. And if you were around then, you'll remember, how did it break out? It broke out in Beirut, and the original fighting was what was called the War of Hotels, the international hotels, big, large, uh, luxurious, luxurious buildings in Beirut were the sort of focal point of the attacks of the different militia units. And gradually, you know, these whole center part of Beirut was just destroyed. And from there, the fighting spread out into the rest of the city, into the suburban areas, and then into the countryside. And, and eventually, the whole country was involved. And you had fighting all over the place. And then you had, you had the Palestinian factions coming in. You had the Syrians coming in. The Americans and French were there for a while. And ultimately, the Israelis invaded. You had a revolution in Iran in 1979. It brought in Khomeini. He was supporting the Shia versus the Muslims. And it became a, a one god holy mess. It's also useful to keep in mind that our own civil war, the last civil war, the 1861-1865 civil war, didn't just begin suddenly in April 1861. It had been brewing for months. You could even argue, and many historians have, it began in Kansas in the late 1850s, what was called Bloody Kansas or Bleeding Kansas, where you had militias and massacres on both sides as Kansas struggled to become either a slave or a free state. We've had things going on in this country uh, for years, and they've just been percolating until we're reaching a more of a boiling point today. There are three things I would point to that have been leading us, helping us along, pushing us along towards civil war. The first is the erosion of a consensus in this country. And I could go into all the different details, but the fundamental part is we no longer have a consensus on a fundamental political economic system. Republican government, market capitalism, that's gone. We've lost that. The second thing is this spread of sanctuary movements, sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties, entire sanctuary states. 
immigration policy is federal policy. And now you have the state saying they're not going to cooperate to some degree or another. And this is eroding federal power. This is a bad sign. It's a sign of a loss of control of the central government and erosion of support for the central government at the local level. The third are Supreme Court decisions, which have taken questions that had once been left up to the states and made them national questions. Sometimes that looks good in the short term, but in the long term, it can erode consensus. The Dred Scott case, it's a classic example. It was a Supreme Court case that was horrible. Not only was it it immoral in the sense that poor Dred Scott was being you know, forced back into slavery, but that was that was only a, a minor part of it. The big part of it was it undercut the Missouri Compromise, where you couldn't have slavery north of the Ohio River. If he'd gone north of the Ohio River and was still a slave, what did the Missouri Compromise mean? So you're undermining a compromise that had helped prevent the possibility of a civil war. And now you have a Supreme Court getting involved, looking at it narrowly, but then broadening out what it wants to say. If they had just focused on Dred Scott, that would have been fine, but they didn't do that. So you end up undercutting one of the main compromises that was holding the country together. And of course, without the Missouri Compromise, without that Ohio River line, then in theory, Southerners could carry their slaves as property any place in the Union. So far from slavery being contained, it was suddenly being expanded. And this heightened the rush toward the election of 1860 and the election of Abraham Lincoln and civil war. And we've had cases like that now, whether they're decided by one side or the other in the court, it doesn't matter. If you nationalize these questions and pull them away from the states, you can actually help destroy the consensus that holds the country together. And I believe that's one of the three things that has happened and pushed us towards civil war. I'd also point to our electoral politics. What's interesting is you go back to the election of 2008, Barack Obama was elected over John McCain. And you look at the writing even before the election, the media reports, and, and, and right after the election, you see a lot of people arguing that the Republican Party was dead. And I'll, I'll post some of these. You can, you can see the headlines. The Republican Party was dead. That was the assumption. In uh, 2009, when Obama became president, they controlled the executive. They were going to appoint people to the courts. They held the Senate. They had the House. The Republicans were in disarray. It was a moment of, of triumph for the progressive Democrats. You had an African-American in the White House, a leading progressive, left-leaning president. They held all the levers of power. And then what happened? It all fell apart. They overplayed their hand. Things they should have gotten done, they didn't. Things that they could have waited on, they took care of. You had the Tea Party movement in 2010, which a lot of people didn't quite understand what was going on. But then you saw the Republicans start to make a comeback in, uh, in 2010, in 2012. And then in 2016, they elect not only a president, but they elect Donald Trump, of all people, which even shocked the Republican establishment. What had happened? In eight years, you had gone from the Republican Party is dead to Donald Trump in office. And at that point, the first two years, he all the Republicans controlled the Senate and the House. That didn't last. But for two years, they did. This was a shock for the Democrats. They thought they had had everything in their hands. They thought they had control over levers of power. And suddenly, it was all swept away in one brief span, and not only at the national level, at the state level, it was even getting worse. I mean, you've probably seen the stories about how many states uh, Democrats lost control of, governorships, legislators. I was living in North Carolina at the time. We had a Democrat governor. We had a, a Democrat uh, Senate and a Democrat assembly. And then suddenly they were all Republican. Just like that. For the first time since Reconstruction, the Republicans were running North Carolina. They have divided government now. How did the Democrats respond to this? Rebuilding their party as the Republicans had done, trying to regroup, go grassroots and all this stuff? No. They launched a coup. 
They spied on the Trump campaign. They protested in the streets. They denounced everyone as a, a, a racist, deplorable. They won't accept the results of the election. Trump was a racist. Trump was illegitimate. Anybody who supported him was a racist. I started losing friends on Facebook because I said, yeah, I, I voted for Trump. End of relationship, 50 years down the drain, simply because I voted for Donald Trump. You're a racist, Mike. Sorry, I don't want to be your friend anymore. Fine. So now we find ourselves in a very difficult situation, especially the president. If he cracks down, he'll be declared a fascist. I don't know why he'd worry about that. They've been calling him a fascist for three years. What's new? What's there to lose? But if he doesn't crack down, he'll look weak and it'll help destroy the economy and make his reelection less likely. So what's he do? Either way, we're going to have problems. Either way, we're going to have unrest. Either way, we're going to have people out in the streets rioting, sometimes looting, burning things down, disrupting daily life in those cities. And there's more people being shot. Murder rates are going up. You have your weekly massacre in Chicago. And it just goes on and on and on. Over 60 days now in Portland, as I record this. What are they supposed to do? I would argue that the Democrats are playing a very dangerous game. They clearly don't want to stop what's going on in the streets, or they would do it. They don't want to be the ones to get their hands dirty, but they, don't, they would prefer that Trump do it. So they could point the finger at him. But in doing that, they're further fragmenting the fabric of this country, which is already fragmented beyond the point that it, it, it may fall apart. It's a dangerous game they're playing. And you say, well, are, are they willing to take these chances? Are they willing to roll the dice like this just for political gain? And my answer is, they sure are. We know they are. They did it the last time. The Democrats did it in 1860. They rolled the dice. They didn't like what had happened. The Republican Party had come out of nowhere after the Kansas-Nebraska Compromise in 1854. And between 1854 and 1860, took over the House, took over the Senate, and took over the presidency. Lincoln became president in 1860. The Democrats wanted to quit. They didn't like the outcome. So they started to leave the Union. Started in late 1860, continued right into the, the spring of 1861. So we know the last time this happened, the Democratic Party was willing to risk the dissolution of the Republic to secure their own political power. In the election of 1864, in the midst of a civil war, they ran a candidate who was committed to peace with the South. If Lincoln had lost in 1864 in his, his re-election campaign, the South would have gone off on its own. Slavery would have continued. The Democrats were willing to do that. Why? To secure their own political power. They were, they were willing to put their political power ahead of national union and ahead of the elimination of the institution of slavery. If they were willing to do that then, you think they're going to be any different this time? You don't think they'll, they'll risk national union again? You don't think they'll risk civil war again? We know that they, they've done it in the past. Why wouldn't they do it again? Anything for political power. So what happens next? I don't know. My guess is if Trump wins a narrow re-election, everything that's happening now will just continue. They'll declare him illegitimate. The protests will continue. The same crap will go on. If, on the other hand, Biden wins narrowly, I don't know what will happen. The last time we saw the Tea Party movement, if you look at what's happening in the country today, Americans are buying weapons. They're buying ammunition. They're arming up. They're forming militia units. Even in the neighborhood where I live, there's more Groups that are popping up in the neighborhood, discussing politics, joining the, uh, I mean, we had, when the riots hit Tampa, it wasn't that far from here. They were burning down businesses. 
I mean, I could drive there in five minutes. So there are people who are worried around here. I mean, I noticed in my neighborhood, there were no Trump signs four years ago. There are is one Trump flag this time around. But I haven't seen any Biden signs. And there were Clinton signs the last time. There are none. So I have no idea what's happening in this community, which is nominally votes Democratic. On the other hand, if Biden or Trump wins a landslide, maybe things will calm down, but maybe not. And I don't know how likely that is. I think if somebody wins a landslide, it would probably be Trump. It's just my guess. I don't think that's inconceivable the way things are going. Because I said, the Democrats are playing a very dangerous game. And you don't know how it's all going to play out. But I really can't say. And we're going to have to wait. But I don't think we'll see an end to what's happening now before then. Uh, Trump can't take the requisite actions to shut it down now. And the Democrats at the local level aren't going to do anything to help him, just as they won't do anything to help him on immigration. We know that. We had sanctuary cities for illegals. We basically now have sanctuary cities for rioters and looters and arsonists, anarchists, nihilists, communists, Marxists, you name it. It's a sanctu- These are sanctuary cities, places like Chicago, Portland, Seattle, others, New York City. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I know the Democrats are playing a very dangerous game and there's no guarantee that they're going to win. And if they lose, all hell is going to break loose. The problem is if they do win, all hell may break loose. So I said, we're already in a civil war. And if you look at our politics as they're playing out right now, and you understand that, then you can see how dangerous the game is. Because we're already in a civil war. You don't want it to escalate the way the Lebanese civil war did, where it starts spinning outside of the little enclaves where it began into the larger cities, into the suburbs, and then into the whole countryside. That can happen. Just because this is the United States and that's Lebanon doesn't mean these things can't happen here. Bad leaders can lead people down the road to shithold them. It's that simple. It's been done. We've watched it. We've seen it. We know it happens. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. And until the next time, I'm out of here.